this time we'll have our second message of the day, sermon by Mr. Matt Steele, entitled Agreements. Mr. Steele. Thank you, Reg. Yes, it is me. I uh, decided it was time to shave off the beard. It's been about six years since I've been clean shaven. And last night I said to my wife, you finally see the face that you married. And she's like, that's not the face I married. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. You know, um, we're all familiar with agreements, aren't we? You know, we've, we make agreements all the way through our lives. We make agreements, hey, we're going to meet at the restaurant later, except maybe COVID uh, time frame. But we make agreements, we're going to meet up with friends. We make agreements uh, to buy a house, buy a car. Um, you know, we call them contracts, we call them uh, different things. But fundamentally, they are agreements. And it's kind of interesting because without agreements, you also had, wouldn't have disagreements, would you? You know, and so the minute that we make an agreement is the minute we need an attorney and a judge. Right? Because inevitably, there's something along the lines that happens and says, well, that wasn't part of the agreement, and somebody else has to make the decision. There's all kinds of agreements in the Bible. Uh, of course, you know, probably the most famous is that first covenant agreement between God and Abraham, that he would bless Abraham's seed, he would bless his descendants, and then also baked into that first agreement, that first covenant, even though it failed because of the sin of the people, baked into it was already the second covenant, the second agreement. Through Abraham, through his seed, being Christ, Jesus our Savior, then we have this agreement for salvation. Agreements are all the way through scripture. And, you know, there's, there's so many different interesting historical elements to all the, the agreements. Agreements the kings made with one another. Agreements that people made with one another. And sometimes the disastrous outcomes of those. And we've learned about God and how he wants to interact with us through those agreements. But these are not the sort of agreements that I want to talk about today. The kind of agreements I want to talk to about today are the agreements that we make with the enemy. The agreements that we make with the enemy. Or with the lies that we have been told by the enemy. And you may be thinking, well, what does that mean? What do you mean by this? Maybe you're not familiar with this, with this term. So I'm going to tell you a story to, to highlight a little bit of what I mean by these agreements. So I think I've mentioned before, when the boys were younger, I would tell stories of the curly-headed boy. And uh, since they're actually not in here, because I always deny that they're my stories, um, the curly-headed boy was me, and we just kind of have this little fun. They know it's me, but I'm always like, oh, it's, I just knew the curly-headed boy when he was young. And so I tell stories about when I was five, six, seven, eight, nine. And some of the antics that I get up to, don't worry, they're sanitized, so they don't, they don't get all the details. But, you know, I have stories like um, the curly-headed boy and the wall of cows, which was the time that the curly-headed boy was on his bike. And I lived pretty close to a, a, a farming community. I'm coming down a really big hill, and I'm going really fast. And I turn the corner, and here is the entire lane full of cows. And of course, I nearly crash into them. The curly-headed boy gets stuck in a tree. I think I may have told you guys that one. I was climbing a tree all alone. And a storm came in, and I couldn't see how to get down. And I was at the top of this tree that was going like crazy. But I prayed and God find, found a way for me to get down. The curly-headed boy and the big dog, which was the big dog that would terrorize me on my walk to school. 
And I was, every time, every day, this huge, big, great Dane would have the most fun time chasing me through this pathway that I had to walk by to get to school. And then, of course, there was the curly-headed boy and the big bike jump that ended up with lots of dirt in my mouth and certain parts of my anatomy crashing onto the bike frame. So I'll leave that to your imagination. But there is a story that I really want to focus on today. And it's, you know, I try to tell it in a positive light, but it's interesting. We all have these kinds of stories. And we may even laugh at them a little bit from our childhood, from our youth. But inside of them are some lies. And inside of them are some agreements that we have made with these lies. So this story is the curly-headed boy and the nice man. So what happened was I really did not want to go to my grandma's house. Um, it was a pretty traditional thing. Every couple of weeks, my mom would grab all of us kids, take us on about three bus rides to get to my Nana Doris's house and well we just didn't have a lot of fun there a lot of our cousins were older and it just you know it was it was really just something that we didn't have a lot of fun with at least when we were younger so I was probably about nine years old and I don't think I necessarily conspired to do this but I was certainly looking for a way to get out of it um, a friend of mine showed up at my house and said hey you want to come on a bike ride with Sure. And I asked my mom, hey, we're going to go on a bike ride. Can I go do this? And she said, well, we're leaving in 30 minutes, so you have to be back in 30 minutes. I'm like, okay. So I left, and off we went. Well, about 20 minutes into it, I realized I didn't know where I was because we're all following this larger, you know, this older kid uh, in our group, and he sent us on a journey. And then 30 minutes, I'm sure, went by. I didn't have a watch. And I wasn't back home, and I was really not knowing where I was. And probably about 40, 45 minutes later, I was in a part of town I'd never been in before. And then I got a flat tire. And I tried to continue to ride, but it just was tearing up the tire and the wheel and everything. And so I pulled off onto the pavement, onto the, you know, the sidewalk, and, and inspecting my bike. And my friends will come around me and look. Oh, you've got a flat tire. Well, they didn't want to wait for me. So they gave me some rather hurried instructions about how to get home and then left. They just left me there. And I wouldn't say I was the youngest, but I, was, I think I was one of the youngest of the group. And so, you know, I headed off walking in the direction of where they said, and it's taking a long time to walk in that direction, you know, compared to riding the bike. And I start to forget which turn was it. Was it this turn? Or was it was the next turn. And before you know it, I am just truly lost. I had no idea how to get home. I didn't have any money to call my parents, uh, to call my mom. No idea. Lost. So what does any nine-year-old boy do when he's completely lost? Well, he loses it, right? So he starts crying as he's walking along the side of the road. And after about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, a car pulls up next to uh, where I'm walking. And the guy winds down the window, and he asks, are you OK? And so in the story, I, I say to the boys, and the man asks the curly-headed boy, curly-headed boy, are you OK? And he says, no, I'm lost. And so this nice man says, well, you know, there's a payphone right over there. Do you know your home number? Yes, I do. So he drove over there. He got out of his car. He put money in the, in the phone. I stayed a distance away from him. I knew that much. <laughs> and he asked me for the number. And he called the number. And he talked to my mom for a minute. And then he beckoned for me to come in. He left. He got in the car and left. And I talked to my mom, and I told her where I was. And that was, that was all I knew of this, this man. I, I barely even remember his face. And so relief, right? 
and somebody knows where I'm at now, and my mom called my dad, and in about 15 minutes, here comes the, uh, the work van that I recognized. And my dad and my Uncle Dave, that had been at work, because they worked together, they came and rescued. That was a big relief. Now, the added bonus was that mom had to leave to go to, to her mother's house. And so, unfortunately, I had to go and hang out with my dad at work, which was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that a lot more. So, what do you think the lie was that got inserted into my boy mind when I was nine years old? Anybody have a guess? The lie that got inserted into my mind, or at least reinforced into my mind, was that nobody wants you, and they're going to leave you behind. Because that's what happened, right? Nobody stayed with me. Some friends they were, right? They could have stayed with me and walked me back. We all could have walked back together. But that didn't happen. And so, inserted into this experience a lie. And then what did I do with that lie? I agreed with it. I'm nine, right? I'm 10, I'm 11, I'm 12, I'm going through life. And, and that, that incident, built upon other incidents, became something in my mind that I agreed with. And that was a lie. So these are the kinds of agreements I want to talk about today because Everybody has them. You're probably sitting there thinking, oh yeah, I have a similar experience. Maybe some worse. Maybe, maybe some the same. So, <clears throat> I agreed with the lie that people will leave me and I will be alone. Still struggle with that lie. Still struggle with it today. I made this agreement. And in spite of the fact, let's, I mean, let's look at the truth of it. What happened? Okay, they all left. But who was with me? God was with me. I already knew who my Savior was at nine years old. He didn't leave me. And then what did he do? He brought the nice man. Right? I wasn't alone then. And then, as an ultimate image, right, of being saved by our father, he sent my dad. So I really wasn't alone. But, but nonetheless, we can just attach ourselves to the wrong parts of our story and the wrong things, the lies <clears throat> that can happen in our story and make these agreements. And then what happens with agreements? I, I describe them in my, in my own mind as they're kind of like lease agreements, right? You start off with one, you're going to lease this property, and then you want to lease it again, so you build on another one on top of that, and another, and another. And each agreement frames the next agreement. These are the sort of lies and agreements that we make with the father of lies. And it goes all the way back to Genesis, doesn't it? <clears throat> to that first lie and that first set of agreement when the first man and woman agreed with the lie that Satan presented in front of them. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, As God in, in, indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, Serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the days that you eat, in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes <clears throat> and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
And she also gave to her, hus her husband with her, and he ate. <clears throat> then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So the first lie and their first agreement right, to believe that lie. Have you ever been fed a lie? <clears throat> I mean, if you've lived on planet Earth, you've been fed a lie, right? Because there's, there's two ways that we are fed lies. There's the lies that maybe people around us might, might tell us, and then there's the lies that we tell ourselves. We all have had experience in these lies. But what we find here at this very beginning, the beginning of our entire race, our entire existence, Adam and Eve believing a lie and agreeing with Satan, making an agreement, and making it in such a way as to say that the agreement that they had before with God, that they trust him, follow him, be faithful to him, that was gone. And now we have this new agreement based on some sketchy information. Because it was a lie. And it did not have all the truth. It had some of the truth. So what was it that they had in here that was enough of the truth to bring them in. Firstly, that if they ate of this fruit, they would not immediately fall down dead. Right? So that was, a, that was true. And yet, that's not what God meant. So they ate this, this fruit. Oh, we didn't die. Okay. Further belief in this, in this lie that we're following here. <clears throat> Their bodies were changed, perhaps, or whatever happened. You know, maybe that, that human physiology was never designed to die. I, I, I don't really know. But God guaranteed that if they did that, they would ultimately die. And they are not here today. And then there was also another tiny bit of truth in here, though. That they would become like God. Right? Knowing good and evil, being wise, having this new experience now to really know what evil was because they did it. Like most things in life, we don't truly know what that is until we experience it, till we engage in it, till we do it. And so, there is a little bit of truth there that they became like God knowing those different things. God himself confirms that man and woman had together become like God. Later he says, now they know good and evil. We've got to stop them from getting to the tree of life. And so he puts that sword in the way to stop them getting to that. But the terrible evil that is in the serp serpent's lie was concealing a greater truth that Adam and Eve did not recognize. Okay, so they were given this set of lies, and they agreed to this set of lies. And then they set us all on this path of being able to be suckered by the lies of the enemy. What were the biggest lies really, in what Satan told Adam and Eve. He implied that they were not like God already. That was a lie. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so he comes along and says, don't you want to be like God? They were already like God. Already like him. Made in his image had a beauty that was reflected of his image. They were already like him. And then, of course, the next thing that it obscured, that it hid, the truth about what God was really doing, was that that wasn't enough. It's not enough to just be like God. His plan was for them to become. 
So now Satan has managed to insert these lies that they have agreed to and bypassed what, whatever that would have looked like that God was prepared to offer them. They were already made in the image of God. They were already like God and on the path to become God, his children. They didn't need the fruit. They did not need the fruit. And they certainly did not need to agree to the lie that Satan was giving them. So in that moment, in that instant, our legacy was set. And we've been believing lies ever since. Haven't we? Believing lies ever since. In spite of having the truth around us. And I really think, you know, I mean, there, there's certainly different motivations for sin. But I think this is the biggest motivation for sin. That we believe lies about ourselves. And we try and cover those lies, cover those perceptions of ourself with actions that lead us to sin. We make these agreements with the father of lies. And it's also interesting, too, I think you can see from, from that Genesis story that the lies are specifically customized for the target. Right? I don't know. Satan could not come along and try and tempt Adam with another woman because there wasn't one. Right? Or vice versa. There, 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 there's a customization to this because the thing that is at most at risk in the garden there and, and puts them at risk in that situation is exactly what Satan went against them with. They're like, God, I've always wondered what that tree tastes like. I've always wondered what that fruit tastes like. It's pretty good. Looks good. So the lies are customized to attack us. But you'd think, like any traditional enemy, right, when you go to war against somebody, a nation, uh, unfortunately, people go to war against individuals, too. You look for the weaknesses, don't you? Oh, I can exploit that weakness. Their rear, their rear line is weak. It's not well defended. That's not what Satan does. I think he attacks us at our point of strength. Because we're already weak in our weaknesses. But if he can sow lies into our character and into our mind, and we make an agreement with that, in the area of strength that could drive us forward towards the kingdom of God and towards the plan that God has for us in our lives, if he can mix that up, and that strength that we would otherwise be able to use, now we are disabled. Truly will be disabled. And I think that's what you see also in that Genesis story. They were already on the path to become God. That was their strength. They were in a perfect world <laughs> with a perfect environment. They had the best possible chance to achieve this. They were in their strength and Satan attacked them in their strength. The enemy targets us with lies in the area of our greatest strengths so he can stop us becoming the children of God. Stop us also helping one another to become the children of God. And he doesn't have to do much after that. Drops the little lie in. Okay, the, yep, they've agreed to it. Now you can sit back and watch as we wrestle with it, as we believe it, and as we hurt ourselves in the process. It's insidious. He doesn't even have to do anything. Another example of these Maybe some of these kind of agreements that people make, that we all make, with lies and with the enemy. I was listening to a Wild at Heart podcast a few days ago, where um, John Eldridge discussed with his guests 
agreements, these kinds of agreements uh, that we make. And one of his guests shared her experience, and she talked in a, a little detail, and I'm not going to go into all of that, but she talked about her, her upbringing and language that her father used to, to really put her down in how she communicated. And, you know, she took that. And she heard his criticism of her method of communication, that she was unclear and incoherent. And, and she took that, believed it, and made an agreement with it. And she's telling this story. And, and she's really, I mean, she's pouring her heart out on this podcast <laughs> with the, you know, the few people around in the studio and then how many hundreds of thousands of people listening. And she is an excellent communicator. I mean, she is a very, very good communicator. And she's, all the while, she's communicating on this high level about how poor a communicator she believes that she is. And it's, it's just incongruent, isn't it? And we, we've all maybe seen that in others. And we've maybe experienced it ourselves. Believing a lie. And, and how much better could she be? How much more confident could she be? And better still, how much more at peace could she be when she's doing her work, which is in communication? And that's what she works in. It's crazy how we can be so damaged and affected by these lies and then our agreement to them. We all have them. Anybody want to say what theirs are? Nah, didn't think so. It's deep. But we all have them. They're painful. And I can almost guarantee, as I said earlier, they're attacking us in our strength, in the areas where we would naturally be strong, where we could give the most beauty and the most benefit to the world and to, our, to the people in our life. Perhaps, as an example, you may have agreed that you're not an art artist. And maybe you work in artistry. <laughs> or maybe you've rejected that and don't. And yet it would be a skill and a talent that you could exploit and use. Maybe that you're not a good singer, not a good writer, not a good communicator, not a good musician, not very good at fixing things, not very patient, maybe not the husband that you think you should be, or not the wife you think you should be, mother or father you think you should be. Don't worry, I'm not listing all of mine. This would definitely put me in some kind of institution if I was believing all of this. But we have those, don't we? Lies and agreements that we've made with them. So what do we do about it? What is the solution? Because it's likely that we have spent our lifetime until now continuing to battle against those things. How can we address these agreements? How can we tear up those agreements? How can we tear them up? You know, can we write them down, print them out, and then ceremoniously rip them apart. Will that work? How can we tear up these agreements? And how do we push back against the enemy when we are tearing up the agreements that comes along with a second copy and says, I have your signature right here. How can we push back against that? Well, I think the first thing to remember, and I, I, I know I said this not too long ago, but it's really critical that we need to remember that we are at war for our life. Our life is on the line. The enemy is out to kill us and everything we love. It's that, it's that brutal. I was reminded of that. We watched, uh, we had a documentary on why we were making uh, dinner last night. It was on the Spitfire. Beautiful documentary, really well done. I think it was on Netflix. 
but the battlefields of the UK, of Britain, became, I mean, they became the battlefields. And right there, people could look up and see the young men of England giving their lives for them. Because there was an enemy that was coming to kill them, to destroy them and destroy their way of life. And war to us now is, is so sanitized, isn't it? Because our military is so much more powerful than nearly everyone else that we go against. And we don't see that battlefield right next to us, but we are at war. In the middle of a debate that Jesus was having with, uh, with a bunch of Jews, it was shortly after they had tried to catch him with the, the prostitute and trying to you know, trick him into, into uh, forgiving her or going against the law and, and trapping him. In John chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus says to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I become nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of the father the devil, and the, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, from his own imagination from his own creation. He's a murderer and a liar, for he is the liar and the father of it. You know, and if, if Satan is trying to tell us something, I'm pretty sure Adam and Eve would wish that they knew this. If the serpent is speaking, he's lying, just like the politician. Right? If a serpent is speaking to you, if the devil is speaking to you, there's no ambiguity. There's no, well, he might have a point here. No, he's lying. It's nothing but a lie. We have to understand that the enemy is powerful and he is out for our life. And we cannot agree to it. We cannot agree to it. We have to recognize. We have to recognize when he is coming against us. Remember what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8? Be sober. You know, be in your mind. Be in your right mind. Sorry, those of you that are in your left mind. But, but seriously, be in your mind. Be aware. Be cognizant of where you are. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of grace, who called us to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. We do have an enemy that's coming after. And Peter knows what he's talking about. Perhaps maybe even more than all the other disciples. He knows what he's talking about. Because you remember back in Luke chapter 22, at verse 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Can you imagine Jesus saying that to you? Satan is after you. Does that make the hair in the back of your head stand up? Not in a good way. Satan was after him. But Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. And it's interesting that, you know, later, of course, Jesus redeems Peter three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then within that is an engagement to do the work that he called him to do. But you can see this experience in the letter that he wrote. 
Because he said here that after a little while, after a little suffering, just like he experienced, then comes this strengthening and establishing and perfecting and settling of us. So Peter knows exactly what it's like to be hunted by Satan. Maybe you do too. Maybe you've had those experiences. But if we are believing lies and making agreements with lies, and the father of lies has given us those lies, then we are all being hunted. But we will have our faith. Jesus has prayed for us. He's prayed for us. That we will stay in our faith. And it is interesting, isn't it? And frustrating. Because Peter did not say, God will remove painful lies. God will remove agreements that you've made. Just like that. He does say there's a suffering. And we want to know, how long? Is it, is it five days? Is it two weeks? Can you give us an end date for the suffering? says, after you've suffered a while, then you will be perfected, established, strengthened, and finally settled. Do you feel settled? I don't know. I've never really felt fully settled. But then, of course, we are called to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth, aren't we? We are wandering through this, this age and through this world, seeking a kingdom, seeking that city. So we're not really, really settled. But he's still working with us, still perfecting us. So we have an enemy, a vicious enemy who's at war with us. The next thing I think we really need to remember and be careful about is stop making agreements. Right? Stop making agreements. Stop agreeing with new lies or new variations of the same old lie. Stop making agreements with the enemy. Remember that when we are hearing a lie, that we do not have to accept it. That we do not have to go into that lie and add it to the list on the shelf of our hearts. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Paul talks about agreements. Now, the context of this agreement, and the agreements he's talking about, is, is it's talking about agreements between people that are believers and non-believers. But I think it's appropriate for us to consider this scripture as talking about our new person in Christ, our believer, and the old man or woman that keeps trying to come back up, right? So if we look at that scripture and think of it in those light, I think it really might help us. It says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communication has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Bial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. I wish I could just stop and remember that when I am wrestling with an agreement that doesn't exist anymore, that shouldn't exist anymore, that we are the temple of God. Are we going to be like Israel, who decided that they would, you know, we're going to bring in a couple extra gods in here, and we're going to bring in some extra idols, and we're going to believe lies about the, 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 the religions of the nations around them? Are we going to do the same with this temple that we are? Believing these lies and agreeing to them. We have the new creature in Christ in us. And we have this old man or woman that keeps trying to come out of the grave. Waving those agreements in our face. See, you signed it. You signed it. But what, but what what does Paul tell us? Or what does he ask us? He says, what communion has light with darkness? 
What agreement has the temple of God with idols? As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Those lies are unclean. Leave them alone. And I will receive you. And I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. Who wants to believe that with 100% and know that to the depth of your soul? And again, an amen. That's what we want. The lies stop us from doing that. There is a no agreement between the believer in us and the, the works of darkness, the lies of the enemy. There is no agreement between the new creature that I am and the enemy and the lies that he constantly is shooting at us. In fact, I don't know if you've thought about this, but in Christ Jesus, we are incapable now. If we live as that new creature, we are incapable of signing new agreements. Do you know why? Because Jesus has to co-sign on them. Because you are not your own anymore. You are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's not signing any agreements for any lies anymore, or he never did. He's not letting us do it anymore. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves of sin, of lies of the agreements that we make with the devil. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the, de for death, for the death that he has died, he's died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives... He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead, indeed, to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How many times have we read this scripture? But what we need to remember when we read it is that we are dead to those old agreements. We are dead to those old lies. We don't have to carry that anymore. We can get rid of it. And let Christ Jesus restore us and heal us. That brings me to the next point. We have new agreements. But these are good agreements. These are beautiful agreements. The old agreements were based on lies. That we were unlovable. That we didn't have value. That you weren't a good person. Fear is a, a really good song. Uh, I forget the title, but fear, fear is a liar, right? Fear is a liar. And there's a line in there that says, when he told you you could be the one that grace could never change. I probably have prayed that a thousand times, when I, certainly when I was younger. That we could be the one that grace could never change. These old agreements, they are lies. And we are done with those. So we need to replace them with good lies. I mean, <laughs> good agreements. Not lies. Good agreements. There is an agreement, isn't there, in the new covenant. The new covenant that we have in scripture. For everyone that opens their heart to Christ Jesus, gets those lies out, and gets the new covenant. So, if we think that we're going to get left alone, if we believe that we're going to get left behind, the words of the Lord in Isaiah 43, verse 1, says, 
But now, thus says the Lord who created you, and he who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Beautiful passage. Anybody want that agreement? None of us, four of us. Okay. We want that agreement. If the enemy tells us that we're a failure, that we're a mistake, what does the new agreement in Christ Jesus say? In Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against us? God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. We're not worthy. We're not lovable. We're not good enough. That's not what God says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Or tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Do we remember those scriptures? (laughs) When we sink into the agreements and the lies, we are more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing, including lies and agreements with those lies, any created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then when the lies say that you're not good enough, the word of the Lord says this in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Not those lies told ourselves. There's also another powerful passage in Job. You know, and uh, Job is just kind of a miserable book, isn't it? But, but yet it has so much truth and encouragement in it, if we would remember to read it. In Job chapter 5 and verse 8, uh, Job's friend uh, Eliphaz, I think it, I think it is, He's, he's kind of berating Job, and he's, he's, he's speaking some words of truth to him here. And I think they're relevant for us. He says, as for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things, without number. He gives rain on the earth. He sends waters to the fields. He, he sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that they, their hands cannot carry out their plan. He catches the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword, from the mouth of the, of the mighty and from their hand. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects, 
Therefore do not despise the chastening of the Almighty, for he bruises, but he binds up. You know, and I think sometimes when we are believing those lies and we are engaging and accepting of that, that agreement to those lies, we're, we're beating ourselves up. But God might just be using that to shape us, to get our attention, to help us focus on things that need to be fixed. He bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he shall redeem you from death and in war from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. Oh, man. That can go into a lie, can it? The scourge of the tongue. People don't like me. They're always talking about me. That's a lie that, that we can have in our mind. And how scourging are those tongues when we believe that and when we accept that agreement. You shall not be afraid of destruction when it comes. You shall laugh at destruction and famine. You shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. For you shall have a covenant, an agreement. You shall have an agreement with the stones of the field and with the beasts of the field. Shall be at peace with you. You know, you think about it in an agricultural society. Stones are not your friend. And you don't want an agreement with those. They get in the way of farming, right? You've got to clear out these stones, these rocks, and it takes time and energy and life force, and you need that space to plant so that if God blesses it, you'll have enough food to carry you through the winter, plant again in the spring. And we just are so far removed from that, and the risk that we, we have when you are living in that agrarian society, that even those stones can be made into an agreement for good. Because what do you do with those stones? You dig them up, right? And then what do you do with them? You build a wall, a protection, a protection around the farm, around that field. Keeps enemies out. It keeps pests out, hopefully. It's about survival. But in the field of our hearts, the rocks are the lies. They get in the way of the planting of the Lord. The seeds and the truth and the beauty that he wants to grow in our hearts. We've got to get these rocks out. Get these lies out that are bringing us down. For you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is in peace. You shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall also know that your descendants shall be many, and your offspring like the grass of the earth. You shall come to the grave at a full age, and as a sheaf of grain ripens in its season. Behold this, we have searched out. It is true. Hear it and know for yourself. A full life. A full life. A satisfied life. A life at peace. Even when destruction comes, as it said earlier, you'll laugh at it. Who laughs at destruction? Those who know where their treasure lies. Those who know where their life force comes from. Those who know their sins have been forgiven, and their lies are being removed out of their life and out of their heart. In closing, I wanted to just turn to Psalm 23 and verse 1. We know it so well, we could probably recite it together, but it just reminds us when we are struggling with agreements, when we are struggling with lies, this is a beautiful scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, no lie, no agreement built on those lies. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord.